And the main idea was to have a home away from home for the soldiers. As our troops grew in, in World War II from 50,000 to 12 million, the USO grew likewise. There were 3,000 clubs around the world where soldiers could dance, see movies, find a private place to write a letter home, and get free coffee and donuts. By the end of the war, one and a half million people had donated their services to help the USO in different capacities, and 7,000 entertainers had been sent overseas. To be sent overseas, you had to pass a very tough audition. And once you were sent overseas, if you were not sent successful in what you were doing, you were sent home. I was 17 when I won a full scholarship to the Juilliard School of Music in New York City. And when I was 18, during the middle of my 18th year, the war was going on, and I decided that I wanted to be a part of the USO. So three girls and I organized a string quartet, two violins, viola, and cello, and we auditioned for the USO and were accepted. So we had to make lots of preparations to get ready to go. The first thing I had to do was to get a suitable violin, because since my family didn't have to pay for my education, I had a full scholarship, they bought me this beautiful violin. It's a Pesos Primarius made in Italy in 1740. And it has the papers of who owned it ever since I got it. And um, a description of it, so I know it's authentic. And the reason I brought it, I thought if any of you are interested in music, you might want to look at it after it's over. But it wouldn't have been practical to take a fine violin like this into a war zone. So I had to find a lesser violin, which I did. Then the next thing to do was to find music to play. We were all trained classically, but we didn't want to go into a ward. We wanted to play in hospital wards only. So we didn't want to go into a ward of six soldiers and be playing Brahms, Beethoven, and Mozart Quartet. So we started looking around for suitable music to play. The problem is we wanted to play either semi-classical or popular tunes of the day. And you can find popular tunes arranged for bands and jazz groups and brass and woodwind, but you really can't for string quartet because that's not the best medium for popular tunes. But we were very fortunate to find a young composition major in Juilliard who agreed to write us some arrangements. His name was Elmer Bernstein. He wrote absolutely fabulous arrangements. And after the war, he became one of the biggest Hollywood writers of musical scores that's ever been in Hollywood. He, he died just two years ago. So we were pretty much set to go, and we got our orders, and it said take a train from New York City to Seattle and then get on a boat. So we got on the Maxonia line, which had been a luxury cruise liner converted to a troop ship. And we had one little tiny room with four bunk beds. And the soldiers were quartered in, in the hold of the ship, which is the bottom of huge room. And they had bunk beds. I have no idea how many there were, but they were stacked on top of each other where you could just barely get in the bed. I don't think they could sit up full. They just barely enough room to sleep. Our first stop was Honolulu, and we were quartered there at a very famous hotel on Waikiki Beach. It was called the Moana, and it had been changed. It had been taken over by the government for rest and recuperation. They call it R&R, &R, where if soldiers who were fighting on the outer, on other islands, got battle fatigue, they were sent there for a few days or a few weeks to recuperate. Now, our agreement with the, with the USO was that we would play three shows a day, a show consisting of we would go from in a ward and play 30 or 40 minutes, and then we would visit with the patients for about 20 minutes. 
And uh, the two chiefs picked us up the first day to take us to the hospital. And after we had played our three shows, we were young and we were very energetic, and we didn't see any reason to quit, so we played all day long. And this became our custom for the rest of the trip. We played all day long. After about three weeks, we discovered, no, it was longer than that, maybe four or five weeks, and on the island of Hawaii, we discovered that we had played every ward in the island, over in the island three times, and this wasn't going to work. We didn't want to keep playing for the same people. So we went to the head of the USO, and we said, uh, we're working more than we're required, so we need to move on. And fortunately, we had gotten very good reports on our show, so they let us call our own shots from then on. They said, we'll send you to an island, that when you feel like you've played all the, all the wards on that island, uh, then we'll send you to another island. So from there, we went to Guam, Saipan, Saipan, Kenyon, Iwo Jima, Peleliu, Ulithi, the Philippines, and Okinawa. And from the minute we left Honolulu, every single thing was changed. We were flown on planes that had been gutted and there were bucket seats, and there was no insulation, so the noise was very, very high. We were quartered in tents with four cots. The hospitals were, where we played were mostly tents or quantity huts. On the islands where we went, there was nothing left. Everything had been bombed, with the exception of the Philippines. And our whole life was very different. Every day we were picked up by two jeeps with two armed guards. Because I'm sure you've heard that, um, particularly on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, there were lots of, of uh, hay, the Japanese still hiding them. Even after the war was over, some of the Japanese in case didn't know the war was over. So our whole method of operation changed. At that time, we began doing everything we possibly could to come in contact with soldiers who were not sick also. We served in chow lines. There was one particular time where a, a really cute guy came up through the chow line six times. <laughs> and this was because these soldiers had been so long without seeing American girls. You didn't have to be pretty or have a cute personality or anything. If you were just from home, uh, they wanted to talk to you and visit with you. We played on Sundays in chapel services. Most of the islands had a non-denominational service, which is held in a quantity hut or a tent, and we would perform a special number. Occasionally, we gave an all-classical concert, which was billed as that, so just those soldiers who liked classical music could come. And we played on some ships. So we did everything possible we could to, to raise the morale of the soldiers. Um, about 90% of the patients that we were playing for had been wounded during the war. There would be 10% that might have an occasional operation like appendectomy, a few diseases, there would be some who had battle fatigue and psychological problems. And when we got to the Philippines, we played for prisoners of war who had been prisoners imprisoned by the Japanese. We had lots of, but the very, very most difficult thing we did on our whole trip was play for the war where there were multiple amputations. The minute you walk into a ward like that, the smell is overpowering, and the morale is the lowest of any war you play for. <coughs> we would try to visit as long as we could, but after every one of those wars like that, I had to find a quiet place and just kind of regroup, because it was, it was heart-wrenching to see the young man who had lost one, two, three limbs. We had lots of unusual experiences in these tents. We were on Guam, and we each had a cot. 
And we were allowed one suitcase each, and that suitcase went under the cot. And fortunately, they had built some shelves for us to put our instruments on. <clears throat> when we went to bed, it was raining quite hard, and when we woke up, there was lots of water in the tent, and it had gotten in our suitcases. So we had kind of a hard time looking presentable for a few days in wet clothes, but we were very thankful that our instruments had not been damaged. As we got to Southern Pacific and were on Peleliu and Ulysses, uh, the instruments became, started to become unglued. This is a common thing. You have the front of an instrument, the back and the side, and they're just glued together. And the, the cello became quite a problem. You can still play it, but it doesn't project like it normally should. And naturally, there weren't any instrument repairmen on Peleliu and Ulysses. Fortunately, when we got to the Philippines, we found a, a repairman, and all he does is take a sharp knife put some glue on it, stick it, it comes unglued, you see, in these places, and he would stick some glue in there, clamp it together overnight, and then it's okay. So we were very fortunate that we were going to one island where there was some civilization. Also, we had a wonderful experience in the Philippines. Uh, we took a train to go to Baguio, which was the summer capital. Now this train was about as dirty as you can get. It was very, very run down and old. And uh, every few minutes we'd have to stop because there'd be an animal on the track, maybe a water buffalo or something. But it was, it was fun for us to see the villagers. Most of them lived in huts because of course they had, been, had a terrible time during the war and were very poor. But when we got to Baguio, it was cool, and this was the first time we'd been cool on the whole trip. And also, some nuns heard we were coming, and they baked the homemade lunch for us. And after eating army rations for uh, many months, well, homemade cooking really tastes wonderful. So this was a real treat. Then our last stop was Okinawa. And this was perhaps the most meaningful one to me because it changed the course of my life. After lunch, it was our custom to take a few minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, just to rest. So on Okinawa, I found a constant hut that was an operating room. And there was an operating table in it. And I called up there to just close my eyes a few minutes. And I realized in just a few seconds that someone had come in the, the room. So I opened my eyes, and it was a young man who introduced himself from Texas. He said he was from Texas, and that my colleagues told him that he should come meet me uh, because I was from Texas. So we visited just a few minutes, and then I asked him to sign a, a bill of currency that I had from Okinawa. It was the custom when you were in the Pacific Theater, they didn't do this in Europe, but many of the soldiers and sailors that were sent to the Pacific got a, a currency of the place they went to first. And they had their, their friends sign their name and addresses. Then when you went to another island or another country, you got the currency of that country. So since we've been to a lot of places, uh, we start to take these together. So I had a long row of bills of currency from different places that we had been. So we just, this young man and I just had a short conversation, and that was the end of that. And a few weeks later, while we were on Okinawa, uh, we got our orders that we, our USO tour was over. We, we were to go home. They were evacuating all the hospitals in the Pacific and sending them back to the state. So we got back to New York, to Juilliard, and uh, our tour of duty was over. Uh, but there's a sequel to this story. In 1946, in the spring, I was coming to Dallas to play out for a music contest, to enter a music contest. And I thought, being a young girl, I might as well have a date while I was in Dallas. So I got out my long string of bills, and I looked, and let's see, here was one from Eastland, here was one from Fort Worth. Oh, there's one from Dallas. I remember him. Uh, he wasn't too bad. So um, I wrote a letter and said, I'm going to be in Dallas. I'd like to see you. 
and we had one day and I quit Juilliard where I had a full scholarship and came back to SMU where he was going to school to catch him and his name is Leighton Stroud. We've been, we were married uh, several years later. We've been married 56 years and he's been on your board for 14 of those years and I want to show you what our daughter did a few years ago. Here's, the, here's part of the bills. I have taken a lot of those bills off this and I have them framed at home. But here's the bill where he signed. Here's the picture of him. And here are the four girls. These are kind of tacky things they gave us to wear when we were not working. And they were long, but it was so hot we cut them off. But um, anyway, uh, this is, uh, was the end of our tour. And I think I came out pretty well uh, catching a man <laughs> that is on the John Brown board. Lady, would you please stand? It's Lady Strauss from Dallas. <laughs> One more thing. He did not go to John Brown. He went to SNU. <coughs> but when he was asked to be on this board, <coughs> excuse me, he got a little soapbox. And if he makes eye contact with somebody, he stands on his soapbox and in five minutes he's talking about John Brown. <laughs> That's the truth. He's the biggest supporter. It's absolutely amazing. And the more times I visit your campus, I become the same one. I think you're very lucky to be here. Thank you. We'll just ask a, a few questions of uh, Mrs. Stroud, and then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Wood. First, I just want to give give you some background. Some of you know this already, uh, some not. Background uh, on the piece of paper that I set out, you have a list of islands that um, Mrs. Stroud played on, and uh, some of those we see here. Um, Philippines, Saipan, did you play in Guam as well? Yeah. Guam, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. And just the basic strategy of the war in the Pacific was to take one island after another, uh, getting closer and closer to Japan so that the U.S. and the other allies, but mainly the U.S., could conduct an air war against Japan. And also in the event that there would have to be a land invasion um, to capture Okinawa, and then that would set the stage for a land invasion. The land invasion ended up not being necessary because of the atomic bomb uh, that ended the war. But that's, these, are, these islands, obviously, the USO goes there after they've been secured. For the most part, although, as you say, uh, for example, in Okinawa, there were still some Japanese in the caves and so on. So I just want to give students that background. Uh, can you tell us briefly who these people are? Yes. Uh, let's, go, let's go at the bottom with them. Maybe a little bit better. Picture. The one on the right is Shirley from New York. Next is Margaret from Canada. Next is Jenny from Indiana, and I'm the one on the right. Uh, Shirley was 22, Margaret was 22, Genevieve was 27, and I was 18. Now, how did the Canadian get into war? Uh, she was a scholarship ju at Juilliard. All oh. of us had scholarships at Juilliard, and that's how we got to know each other. Okay, given you so. Here's some pictures I got of. Uh, you know, you just go into the Google image thing and pop in USO World War II, and here's some of the pictures that came up. Do you remember seeing these kind of posters when you were? Yes. Before you went yes. in? And uh -huh. The appeal to patriotism here. Uh, you said that you went to hospitals and you would talk to guys. Does this picture remind you of, I don't know if she's USO, she may be a nurse, but does this look familiar, sort of a tent hospital? And. Uh. You know, ours was an entirely different thing. We went right into the ward and we were surrounded. We were in a ward with full of beds of patients. Okay. And they would simply sit on the bed and uh, on the bed. They would sit up and sometimes in chairs and kind of surround us. So that was a very intimate, uh, a lot of request numbers and so forth. So it wasn't like a regular show, so to speak. It, it was just a very intimate, uh, gathering. Okay. And then I just wanted to show the students uh, this one. We'll focus on this and I'll just have another couple questions. Uh, here you have USO. I'm not sure where we are, but the sign says if you want to go to heaven, go to church with an angel. Girl, 
pick up at 10.30 and a girl will go with you to the Methodist church. <laughs> That's how you attract girls. When I was in the Navy, they attracted us to church with free meals and things like that. So here you get a girl escort go off there going to the Methodist church. I guess that's a good thing to do it's in the U.S.O. So does that probably sound familiar? Yes, the U.S.O. had, I've just told you about two things, the shows and, and, and the work that we did. But the U.S.O. was an arm of an organization and they did everything possible they could think of. Of course, Bob Hope was the most famous of all with a big show. But it came on down to, I knew, uh, one professional ping pong player that went overseas giving ping pong uh, exhibitions. So they had everything, every sort of entertainment, anything that would lift the spirit of the soldiers. I just have a couple, couple questions, uh -huh. then we'll go to Mr. Wood. Uh, you said you came across some soldiers who had battle fatigue, um, and I'm wondering if you could describe what that's like. What is what is the soldier like? What does the soldier look like when he's suffering from what then was called battle fatigue? Well, the main thing I would say would be depression. Um, and, and there were quite a few of those that you can understand going through everything. And of course, Arthur would know more about that than I would because I'm sure he saw a lot of soldiers who were, were burned out and, um, and had fatigue. But, it was just uh, very hard to, to bring them out of, to, to bring them out. However, they still enjoyed talking to someone from home. Uh, it was just how, I'm sorry, how, how old would you say the average soldier was in the Pacific? Uh, 18 to 25. Of course, a lot of the officers were older, but I'm saying the average. This was a very young service. During, during the war, wasn't it, Arthur? Uh, there, were, there were lots of them that were older, but I would say this was the majority. And there were even a few had lied about their age and said they were 18 when they were just 17 or 16, because this was a different war. Every single person in the United States wanted to be involved in this war. Um, we didn't want to end up speaking Japanese. Hmm. Last question before we go to Mr. Wood. You said that after especially after being in the wards with the amputees, that you just need to go by yourself, and the term you used is um, that you would regroup. And I'm wondering, what, what, what did you do to Actually, regroup? Actually, I, I cried. <laughs> and I had a hard time even talking about it. Because I was in the newspaper. But I usually just had to get away and, and cry. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. We'll we'll come back and ask some more questions. Why don't we turn now to Mr. Wood for a brief presentation? You want to put the map up here? There's the dates on it. Oh, I uh, I have another map I can put up on that. I don't think I have that one with me right now. Let me give you a big picture of the war. <clears throat> I uh, graduated from the University of Oklahoma in May of 1941, and that was before Pearl Harbor. And I volunteered for a year's activity because I was commissioned in ROTC as a second lieutenant of artillery. And so uh, I was in before Pearl Harbor in the old peacetime war. Uh, looking at those dates, you realize very quickly that we there had been a war going on in Europe for two years. Uh, 1st of September, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And the minute they invaded the western half of Poland, Russia came in and said, I want the eastern half, which was totally a, a opposite to the promises they'd made to each other. But that goes on. And so here I was graduating in May of 1941 with a commission, and I volunteered for that year because I knew that things were going to happen, and I just didn't want to get the business started or do anything else until I just came on in. And fortunately, that put me a year ahead of everybody else in getting promotions. Uh, 
I trained at Fort Sill for a year and a half in various <coughs> areas, orientation classes, teaching. I was in so early, I was in the horse-drawn artillery even, uh, and enjoyed that. That was like, you know, like I had $15 a month for social things while I was in college, and now all of a sudden I'm a second lieutenant they're paying me $160 a month and providing all my room and board except for the officer's club fees. So I, was in, I enjoyed that for six months a lot. But then they send me to the, uh, everybody knew you, eventually you go to a unit. So I was, in January of 43, I joined the 95th Infantry Division at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, and we trained for a year and a half. I was a battery commander. I had command of four howitzers. Uh, they are 105 millimeter, about four inches. They shoot a 35 pound shell, and they're very effective as close support to the infantry. Um, they have larger guns, 155 howitzer, 155 gun, 8-inch howitzer, and even I had operational availability of a 240 millimeter uh, gun that would fire 15 or 20 miles, but we couldn't see that far, so we didn't fire that thing very much. Uh, after uh, the training which we had at Louisiana Maneuvers, Advanced Officer Kugels, and all these things were going on as we approached time. Uh, we knew we were going overseas, but we were not sent to England until July and through September of 44. And in looking at that date, you'll realize that I was very glad that it was after D-Day. So I was not involved in D-Day, fortunately. Can you just tell the students, for some of the students who don't know briefly what D-Day was? D-Day, they call it D-Day because it's uh, it's the point where you cross the line of demarcation between units. Americans on this side, enemy on the other side. When you, D Day is when you cross that line. <coughs> so that's how it gets its de designation. That was the day that the United States Army invaded Europe by sending troops into Utah Beach, to Omaha Beach, and the British and Canadians went into Juneau Beach which we'll take a look at in just a minute. Uh, it was a horrible experience in Omaha. They had 14,000 casualties the first day. And 14,000 casualties, you realize, is a whole division and a half of men. And so uh, they fortunately clawed their way up the ship, up, up there to the top. And Utah Beach was able to loop around and cut off some of the supplies. And then they, they organized Patton's Army at that point, uh, and I became part of Patton's Army. And <clears throat> he cut out as soon as they broke through that hedgerow area, <clears throat> which is right behind Omaha Beach. Hedgerows are where you have a, a field that may be twice the size of this room, or maybe as big as this building only. And then there'll be a 15, 20 foot where they just piled up the rocks out of the field over the centuries and let brush grow on there. And the Germans would simply go in through the backside of that field, generally at the corners, because you had a better field of fire there. And they would dig in from the backside and leave a cut on the front side about this big so that any troops that came out into this field, they could cover it with machine fire and you couldn't get across there unless you're dead. And so uh, the hedgerows were a tremendous ob obstacle to breaking out. And that's another story, because fortunately I wasn't involved in that either. But we went in in uh, September, it was apple time, and all of our trucks were immediately confiscated by the headquarters to run gasoline up to Patton. And he was racing across France and uh, trying to break up all the opposition, and the German army pulled back clear to the Moselle River, which is in the northeast corner of France, just south of Luxembourg. And you want to put that map up there? Well, I'm not sure if I have a map that shows that, but I'll look. Go ahead and okay. go on. Okay. It's just the area up there. So we stayed in the Apple Archer to all the rest of the units except the trucks. And then in October, we entered combat because they could not uh, 
capture the fortress of Metz, which was astride the Moselle River. It had only been captured once in a, a 2,000 year history of that area of Lorraine. And it was in, encircled by something like 29 Franco-Prussian War forts. These are the ones you see in pictures with the great big inner sort or, and great big stars sticking out of corners so that they could cover all the areas and they were bunkers were 20 feet underground so you couldn't get to them even with artillery and so we got in there and they pulled our little battalion out of the battalion is three rifle companies a headquarters company which has heavy machine guns instead of light machine guns out here it has 81 millimeter mortars instead of 30, 60 millimeter mortars which the rifle companies have and so with those two heavier weapons, they're called heavy weapons, and they have some 50 caliber machine guns to supplement the light air-cooled uh, machine guns that the rifles carry. So my job was to bring the artillery wire and radio network up to the infantry wire and radio network, which centered in the infantry battalion commander. So the infantry battalion commander had a staff of an operations officer, an intelligence officer, and a supply officer, which we saw occasionally just so he kept the supplies, and the headquarters communications. So my job was to associate with them. I didn't have a lot of association with the rifle companies because our battery would send up three forward observers, and the forward observers then went up with the rifle companies where they were in touch with their radio networks and were, would give us fire missions from up there and I would coordinate them and sometimes get involved. Uh, so that was my job to work with the battalion commander. Um, we were called out suddenly because we couldn't get through the fort down here. The 90th Division had crossed 15 miles upstream and was being counterattacked and their infantry was falling back, clear back to the guns. They were dug in right in front of the guns themselves. And it was a horrible situation. So they sent our little battalion of 800 men across this river halfway in between where another battalion had not been able to cross. And lo and behold, those blessed does captured the railroad station. They captured a fort over like, the blown out bridge. <coughs> they spent the night that night they cleared the hill above it the next day. The next day they cleared out the fort on this side, and by that time the Germans had withdrawn from the fort on that side. So now the bridge is free from mortar fire, which means the Germans are back at least a thousand or two thousand yards. And Patton is building a Bailey Bridge back here, and a Bailey Bridge is where you construct the girders, and they start here, they're about this high, and then they take a tank having built up the abutment here and the abutment over there, they take this monstrosity like an electric, electric set and push it across the river and they tilt it up and hopefully it's tilted high enough and goes out far enough and drops on the proper abutment without falling into the river. And it worked. <laughs> and uh, by that time I'd been across the river working with this fort operation and uh, I came back, had to take a boat back because they wouldn't let you cross there. They had, he was, Patton was standing there like this. The 10th Armored was going through. He would say, faster, faster. And the 10th Armored went through and that immediately fanned out behind the Germans and they immediately retreated from the river site. And that relieved the 90th Division and we picked up this lost division. And then we went in and back circled next on the back side capturing the last fort and uh, that was the uh, ninth end of the operation. But three days later we were headed for the Star River which was 20 miles away and uh, they took us under light artillery fire and we lost two battalion commanders that day. We'd already lost one back there. I was standing next to him and he got shot and uh, we lost two of the artillery fire and I got shrapnel through my bridges that day and we got down to the river bank and by the time we got down to the river bank and got ready to cross this 800 man group was down to 360 men 
and we had orders to cross uh, on the Putnam Bridge, but they blew it out that night, so we came back. They blew it out the next night, we came back. We were ready to go out across at midnight, you know, something like that, under the dark, to get into, we'd already gotten a company across the river at night by just boats, and they'd captured a few houses across a 300-foot floodplain and in behind the pillbox. So we were relatively safe if we could get away from those pillboxes and that hill of observation. What's a pillbox? Pillbox is a concrete abutment that's about as big as this room, about this half a room round. And it has places inside it, six or eight feet of concrete here and here, and it has an aperture that points out this way, and there's one guy or two or three guys with a machine gun sitting here and then bunk, bunk beds down below. In other words, it's impervious to rifle fire and artillery fire. And you try to capture it, the Germans fire on top of it at the command of the request of people inside. And you can't get close to it because German fire is bouncing all around it. And so, uh, there's a way to capture it. I'll tell you later if you want to know, but it takes a little time. <laughs> Uh, and the artillery and the engineers and the infantry are all involved and there's flamethrowers involved and the engineers with satchel charges and uh, coordination with the artillery together with the fact that this pillbox sitting here firing this way has another pillbox down here firing that way and this way and they can cross their fire and another one over here crosses its fire then there's a bunker back here that can reinforce them all which has 20 or 30 men in it and so it's a, well, that's the secret line. And in between gaps of these strong points, they had uh, dragon teeth, anti-tank traps, so you couldn't get a tank across. And yes, you can fire at these pillboxes with a tank, if you can get the tank up to where it can fire inside the aperture. But by the time it comes up to fire inside the aperture, the enemy's heavy artillery is zeroed in on the tank and it can knock out a tank. So you don't do that promiscuously. So anyway, we got across the river and then had to pull back with the bulge taking place. The bulge, as you recall, happened up in Belgium where the Wehrmacht said, we're gonna have one last, they pulled all their 17 and 18 year old recruits together and they trained them for six months and they put them with the SS tankers and they said, we're going to have one more push and we're going to get to the Meuse River at Liège and we're going to cut off the supplies to the English Army and the Northern American Army. And then we'll sue for peace because they can't supply their armies and we'll capture them. Well, that was the bulge. And so we have four divisions, like the 95th, in a corps. Uh, when the bulge took place, all the divisions pulled back across the Saar River. They'd all made crossing various little points. We pulled back across the Saar because we couldn't expend any more ammunition up there. And then our division, fortunately, was chosen to cover uh, the 20-mile front that the Corps had. Now, if I say to you that ordinarily we cover a four-mile front, you know how thin we were spread along there. And so we covered that four mile. The other three divisions went into the bulge which, as you know, was real tough and real cold and real horrible, and the war could have gone either way, but it fortunately went our way. And while we were down there, <clears throat> then, they, you always probe each other. You always send out the probes. You want to know where the enemy is, whether you're having a combat operation or not. And they're sending out theirs. Well, they found a spot in our lines, and they sent across a battalion on New Year's Day. And we had to go out and meet that counterattack and uh, threw it back and they withdrew. And so the rest of January was all right. And then we went north after, in the realignment and came in behind the ruler and were able to be part of the cutoff and capture some of the northern German cities. And then basically the war was over. We were fighting 15-year-olds and 55-year-old men by that time. That's all the German army had left in that area. 
and Berlin had fallen, so they sued for peace. And uh, we went into civil government, and I took over a POW camp that the Germans had used for their Polish POWs. And as I told our group, uh, first thing to do is make a camp inspection. And we found three plots of huts out there, and they were filled with the art of Europe. You look, you open the door, and here is a painting that's as big as this wall down to the door and over to here and that high and has a gilt frame this big all around it and then a whole bunch of little ones leaned up against it. We put double guard on that and notified the headquarters and said, come get it. They said, no, we leave it there, but don't touch it. So we sealed off that part of the camp. And then we, the townspeople wouldn't believe that their side had lost and that they had been so atrocious in their activities. So we went out behind and dug up some of the bodies that they killed and made the town people walk by and look at them. And then we got orders to go to Japan. And so we checked out real quick, went down to La Harve, got on the ship, had 30 days of rest real rehabilitation in, in the States. We cleared back to Fort Sill, uh, back to Cape Shelby, and they dropped the first bomb. Nothing happened. They dropped the second bomb now. Understand that one division is already out of San Francisco headed for Biltine and Okinawa. The 84th Division has just left the docks and our advance party has everything ready for us to be there next week. And they dropped the second bomb and they sue for peace. So they call down and say, fine, war's over. You disbanded and in 30 days I was back home and entered the life insurance business and was a salesman for the next 50 years and enjoyed it where I knew Leighton Stroud and uh, retired. It was a good thing. My son is now actually with New York Life and has had 30 years and enjoyed it more than I did. So that was my war experience before and after. How came about. Great. Well, let me, I'll just show Matt real quick and then I'll ask <coughs> Mr. Lowe a couple questions. Then I'll have a few questions for both. Uh, we just, just unplugged. Okay. Thanks. Greg, thank you. Uh, we just have about 10 minutes, so um, after I ask Mr. Lowe a couple questions, I'll see if there are questions here. This is the basic theater of operations that uh, Mr. Lowe operated in here. I don't, I don't know where Mets would be, right, right around here, something like that? It's just where? 20 miles south of Luxembourg, right where that star mm -hmm. is. Okay, so right okay. around there then. Okay, so this is, this is the, the um, theater of operations. Let me ask you, I just want to put up a picture, and um, uh, Mrs. Stroud mentioned battle fatigue, and you know, this is a German soldier, obviously he's well armed. Um, um, Look at that, that's a bastard as cold as I was. Yeah. This is uh, probably taken December 44, Battle of the Bulge. What, what, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind when you see that picture of that German soldier? First of all, that's an effective looking soldier. He is capable. And that's what we were up against. And that's the kind of man that was initially against us. And you had to root him out by being more capable, more daring, and with more better, better equipment and better strategy. Did you, um, veterans tell me different things. Uh, some veterans say, when they thought about the Germans, uh, they just wanted to uh, they just wanted to get revenge. Maybe a friend of theirs is killed in battle. They want revenge. Others say, in my for me, the German that German guy was just fighting for his country the way I was fighting for mine. I had no personal feeling. How did you feel about the Germans who were shooting at you and your shooting your artillery at them during the war? Well, first of all. And this, is, to me, it seemed critically important. Here I was, a fresh faced kid, just out of college, just out of high school, just out of college, just in the military with all the other fresh faced lieutenants from all over. And you get into combat and you realize, you guys are trying to kill me. And it has to come through to you very clear that this is what's going on. And it, 
you ever have a confrontation, you plan in advance. It's going to be me or him, and I'm going to get him. But I never felt deep vengeance for the enemy after that. We picked up a field up at one time and uh, put him on the front of our Jeep, and it was cold as a blister. And uh, we had to drive five miles, and he was hanging on to the wire cutter in front of the Jeep, stands up on the hood. And he was holding up on there, and I was just saying to myself, serves him right. But I bet he's happy to be cold and captured and not out there fighting again. <laughs> and then I served, I saw some Germans. My son-in-law was a chaplain in the Air Force, and we went over to Germany when he was there, and here were German officers in liaison with what he was going through. And I just didn't have any hatred for him, but I sure didn't want any part of him. Well, this is a picture of a cemetery in uh, Metz, and um, I'm not sure if it's just Americans here, but there are a number of Americans here. Uh, so these are the guys who fought where you fought, uh, but didn't come home. And I'm just wondering what what thoughts come to mind when you when you see that picture. The first thing is I'm glad I'm not there. And the second thing is to realize, as we talked about earlier. Everybody in combat thinks, I'm not going to get hit. And so, you go through on that basis and you do what you have to do, and fortunately you don't get hit. But some friends do. So, you, in the earlier group you told us about one fellow from Stanford, could you tell the Yeah, when we were in him? training in Fort Sill, there were five of us very close together and lived in the same house in town. And he was cum laude, Stanford, teetotaler, and, and a really great guy. But after the bulge, they found his body with his hands tied behind him with wire and a pistol bullet in the back of his head. So when the SS had gone through in the bulge, they didn't want to take prisoners. The SS being the Nazis. Nazis. Um, when you heard that news, do you remember what went through your mind? Yeah, I'm just sorry for Charlie because he's the only son, the only child in that family and his widowed mother. And we'd been in touch with her because he'd been to our home several times during that year in Fort Sill. She never responded. We just couldn't reach out to her. I'm sure she was devastated. Uh, after the war, did you ever find your mind wandering and you would just think about him from time to time? Thought about him, thought about all the other activities. Let me tell you an interesting thing. I grew up with a Scotch-Irish mother who had biceps bigger than I was mine, but she wasn't fat. She's a very practical woman. And if you had a nervous breakdown, you just got over it. So I grew up with that sort of an attitude. One of our really good sergeants was hit in the back of the head with shrapnel. I penetrated his helmet and hurt him, and he was paralyzed for a long time. And we were all concerned about him and what happened because he was one of the most popular and effective men in our battalion. And so after the war, I'm in a meeting, a business meeting, and I'm sitting down in this 15th floor of a big high skyscraper, and my head starts to hurt. I don't have headaches. I've been out of, out of service for about six months now. My head started to hurt, and I couldn't find out why. I looked around. What makes my head hurt? And I realized that my back was to a window, and that's where he was hit. He, a shot shrapnel had come through a window and hit him. And I moved over this way until I could have the pillar between the windows behind me, and my head had quit hurting. So I became convinced that there are psychological things going on with us that we don't know. And you have to take them into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have a couple minutes, and I don't want to push it past three. Does anybody have a question that you want to ask? Go ahead, Danny. Uh, first of all, thank you for starting. We appreciate it. I um, wanted to ask us to do that. Can you explain what it was like to go in to do this? 
the POWs that were there, were they... No, no, it was, it was empty. Oh, it was empty. Was empty. Was empty. In Germans, they cleared it out. Okay. But there were some... Remains. Remains of and both... And interestingly citizens. enough, it was run by German conscientious objectors. A staff of six or eight conscientious objectors. Bar bar all around, barracks inside, and uh, concert huts, and then we had some areas across the street, and some playgrounds, and the first thing we did was create proper sanitation facilities. One of the first one asked a question. I have a last question I want to ask. Anyone else want to ask a question? Can I just say uh, one go, thing? Yeah, go I ahead. wanted to make something clear, and that is when you asked me the question what I did to recoup, I never cried in front of soldiers, ever, ever. I found a quiet place to do my tears. And was that because you realized they've had enough to deal with and they all need to? Well, that was because I had a hard time dealing with them. Yeah. But their entry seemed been so hurt. Okay, Cody asked a question, then I'll have a last question. Go ahead. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your interaction with civilians? Uh, first of all, we came in after the initial fighting had gone through when we first went into combat. So the Germans had evacuated people. And so I say to everybody, how would you like to live every night with a suitcase packed under your bed with a couple of bottles of water, spare socks, extra pair of shoes, a blanket, so that if you get a knock on the door in the middle of the night and they say, out, you go. And that's what occupation means. So we didn't have any touch with them, except when we got to the Sara River. Now, these are German civilians. And we had advanced so fast that they hadn't had time to evacuate. And all of a sudden, we found that they were back behind us in caves, and they knew where the caves were. And there was a water pump out uh, two or three hundred yards in front of the caves out in an open field. And we had to protect them because the Germans didn't know that they weren't our, our military. And you go out to pump water for your people back in the cave and they fire at you. So we would take, that, take them out under cover of tanks pump the water and come take them back in and start feeding them. But we had no other contact with them. So that's all, fortunately. Oops. Here's the um, last question I want to ask, and if we could just get a, a, a brief answer from both. Um, something that's interesting to me is that most veterans I've talked to, actually all but, all but two, uh, even if they were Christians at the time of combat, they said that, um, or what I've heard from veterans is that being in combat, it's almost like combat is a God-free zone. Even even if they are Christians, when they're in combat, um, there's just a disconnect, which is counterintuitive because you have this idea there are no atheists and foxholes, but what a lot of vets say is when you're in a combat situation, you're not thinking about things that people might expect. You're not thinking about the afterlife. You're not praying and so on. And I'm just wondering, you know, you have two very, two different experiences. Here's a picture of uh, Catholic Mass on the island of, I believe it's Oak, Iwo Jima, I think that one. So clearly there are chaplains there. But what was your sense of that, the importance of um, not just sort of Marine Corps, God and Country stuff, but of real faith that is active even in a combat situation? Do you have any or faith in the lives of men that you came across in the hospitals. Do you have any, any, anything come to mind related to that? I just say that I prayed a lot for them. Did do you remember them asking you to do that? Or no. Did did you remember uh, soldiers ever asking you an amputee, for example? Why would God let this happen to me? I mean, did any of those kinds of questions ever come no, up? No, actually, the soldiers who were sick mainly just wanted to talk, just average talk to a girl on the phone. They weren't talking about their problems so much. It's just a kind of casual conversation just to talk to them on the How about you, Mr. Brown? Uh, two things. Um, I thought I was a Christian when I went overseas. I found out in talking to people later, I was a deist. God was all-powerful. He could handle everything. I'd bring to him. But Christ was 
one of the pastors saying, when I didn't need him, I could talk directly to God. And I remember they had a, we had a chapel service on the field one time, and the chaplain didn't show up, and I had a few words to say out of my Bible to the 20 or 30 that were there. And then we got into the SAR operation where we lost so many men and we were down to trying to get across the river and backing up every night. And so I did what I told the finger dipping theology. I pulled out my little Bible and said, Lord, speak to me. You know, roll the pages and put my finger in. And it said, it, it came time for the Passover. And I said, yes, Lord, we're getting ready to go across the SAR. You picked out a good verse. It became time for that for the Passover, and Jesus knew that death was nigh. I said, I don't like that. <laughs> and 20 years later, I told my wife that, and she said, well, you should have been real happy with that. I said, why? She said, you're the oldest son, aren't you? And so the Passover the Passover had gone over the oldest son. <laughs> did, did, when, when you were in combat, did you have any sense of the presence of God? Yeah. As I say, as it is, he was there, he knew me, I knew him. Lord, one more day, let's go. And he was there. Okay. All right. Later on, when I got came back, married, active in churches, we got deeply involved with Campus Crusade and uh, Young Life besides our church and uh, did a lot of evangelical calling and I realized that being a deist wasn't all there was to it. Being a Christian was more important. Well, thank you very much.